ओके हाय join but okay i'll start uh, hopefully people will join in between and i'll admit them as and when people join okay so uh this is the live tutorial session for the nptel rl course and uh we'll be mainly looking at the contents of week nine so my plans for today is as follows so my plan today is i'll uh uh make a, a deeper look into the dqn algorithm we'll uh study it in depth and then uh do some implementation using uh, uh, PyTorch and uh, stable baselines. Okay, so that's my plan for today. So this will be uh, like a short uh, class, uh, like not uh, going the whole one hour, but maybe around you know 50, 45 to 50 minutes class. Okay, so uh, I hope people will join in the meantime. But uh, since I'm running behind schedule, I should start the lecture. So Okay, so uh, in case you're joining for the first time, my name is Manav. I am a PhD student at ECS department and I'm one of the TA for this course on uh, the NPTEL website. Okay, and okay, so uh, we'll start off with the introduction to DQN networks. Okay. The DQN stands for Deep Q networks right so the thing is uh, so far we have uh, studied about uh, q learning and now we would like to uh, look at the uh, as we uh, move towards deep rl we would like to look at uh, how deep q learning works so before that it's uh, like only fair if we do a quick revision of what has been covered in q learning so far so i'll uh, quickly jot down so in Q learning, what happens is it's like you uh, you know the expected reward of agent at each step right this is one of the first point the second point in q learning uh, looks like it's you essentially have have some kind of a cheat sheet okay i should put it in quotes and or as sir likes to call it in the lecture this is some sort of a lookup table that you have uh, uh, which you know agents refer to uh, in order to know in order to know which actions to perform okay and uh, third thing is that it will uh, perform sequence of actions that generate the maximum total reward right so this is q learning this is a quick recap to Q learning, right? So uh, the thing is, Q learning equation. Okay, I should again write this. This is Q learning recap. Okay, maybe ignore this for now. This is a recap for Q learning. So 
the updates for my Q learning look something like this. So it's R of S comma A plus gamma times max of A Q of S prime A, right? So S prime is the uh, next state uh, that you are visiting from state S. So from state S, you take action A and then visit a next state S prime, okay? Okay, hi, I have already started. So we'll just continue with the uh, discussion. So uh, the plan today is I'll be uh, looking at uh, BQN. So before that, I'm just, I have, Till now, I have been doing a quick recap of what Q learning is about, and then we'll uh, have an in-depth look at the DQN algorithm. That's my plan for today. Okay. Uh, and uh, you had a doubt, right, in the discussion forum. Uh, maybe you want to discuss it right now, or should we discuss it at the end? No, yeah, let's discuss it at the end. Okay, sure. Right. So uh, what this uh, this is the uh, Q update, right? Or rather, I should say, uh, this is the update in Q learning. So, uh, what it does is uh, your Q, um, your Q value essentially is your immediate reward. plus the highest possible Q value from next state, right? This is the basic idea of uh, Q learning because you are uh, trying to solve the uh, optimal Bellman equation in, in Q learning. So you can say that my Q of S comma A is sort of dependent on Q of S prime comma A which in turn is dependent on q of s double prime of a and the dependence goes like till you reach till you reach the terminal state right so unless you reach the terminal state all of the q functions are correlated because i'm looking at the immediate reward and then looking at the next highest possible q value in the next state right so this is s of p comma a so this is how the uh, Q learning dependence looks like, right? Uh, now, uh, also I should add some gamma here because that could be a correct representation. So this is gamma three and gamma of some, let's say N of T, okay? So this is the number of, uh, like steps you took to reach the terminal state. Okay, so since uh, this is some sort of a recursive equation, so you can uh, you know make an arbitrary assumption that uh, having enough experience, this uh, this update should eventually converge to the optimal Q value because this because we are looking at a discounted future reward, and this is a, a decreasing uh, like GP kind of a thing. So you. You can uh, make an arbitrary assumption that eventually whatever value we converge to would be uh, it will converge to the optimal Q value, right? So since this is a discounted recursive equation, the the arbitrary assumption. is that it will eventually converge right okay so uh you have uh this thing for your q learning okay now the question is uh since this q learning you know works very well you can you know, get the optimal solution in uh, less number of time. Why uh, do we need to go for a deep, deep learning setup? Right. So the question is uh, now, why deep 
RL or why deep Q learning. Okay, so uh, one of the main reason for this is that let's say uh, you have you know some state space which is of size ten thousand. You have a uh, you have a environment which has ten thousand uh, steps, and then the action space is roughly around one thousand. So in this case, your Q table should be, you know, the size of S cross A, right? Which is all, which is one million. So uh, what you are trying to do is you are trying to basically keep an update, keep a tabular update of the each and every state action pair that you have encountered so far, and. Uh, if you know I have uh, an MDP having 10,000 states, uh, I mean the total state space to be 10,000, and I have 1,000 actions that I can take, then uh, my Q table uh, is uh, the size of my Q table is uh, almost uh, one million, and also uh, you know come to a conclusive. Uh, I can't come to a direct conclusion if I visit each uh, uh, state action pair only once. So I should. Uh, Visit it, revisit it sufficiently enough so that uh, the table, the tabular update is relevant, right? So uh, that's why uh, things can quickly get out of control, as in when if we uh, keep on increasing the states and the action pair, right? And also the second thing is that uh, we can't infer the uh, Q value of a new state uh, from something that we have previously explored. So a new state as in uh, an unseen state, we can't infer the Q value of an unseen state that was uh, previously not visited right so the thing is uh, one thing is that the amount of memory required increases as total state slash action space increases Okay, uh, so you can see how quickly uh, the Q learning method can be memory intensive. So for a uh, small state space, you can uh, get the solution quickly. But eventually, if you are trying to move to you know higher order, uh, like higher uh, dimension of uh, states, then uh, this becomes problematic because you need more and more memory. And second thing is that uh, the amount of time needed to explore uh, each uh, state and to compute updates will also increase, correct? So I can say that this is also you know time intensive. So if you have uh, studied uh, algorithms, data structures and algorithms, you know, uh, like if these two uh, conditions, you know, come up in an algorithm, then that's a big red flag, right? You don't, uh, that's like a very naive kind of an algorithm. You try to eventually look for a better solution that is either uh, uh, like less memory intensive or uh, less time intensive, right? So uh, that's why uh, eventually there came up a need to develop a deep RL algorithm, right? So, uh, so far, what we have been looking at is a uh, classical RL, uh, starting from the bandit formulation, then the uh, planning using the dynamic programming formulation, then the Monte Carlo and the TD approach. All of these come under the uh, under uh, classical RL. So, eventually, uh, in 2015, what happened is uh, DeepMind, the, this was a relatively unknown company during that time, they came up with a paper in 2015, which was uh, title something, I don't remember the exact title, but they introduced deep learning for the first time. So uh, so the uh, idea behind which they developed uh, the deep learning algorithm was basically to solve Atari games. Okay, So the paper uh, says that uh, there are, uh, they basically test out uh, on 50 different Atari games uh, and they compete with a human expert. Okay, And uh, what the paper uh, uh, like concludes is that the uh, DQN network that they have built 
is able to beat a human expert in 43 of the 50 games. Okay, so this is like one of the beginning phases of deep RL. And after that, uh, you know, in 2016, uh, they improved on the algorithm. Then they uh, challenged the uh, like highest rated, uh, highest rated uh, Go player. And uh, like after that, uh, you know, uh, Al AlphaGo defeated the uh, highest, uh, like the best ever Go player. Uh, the like best uh, go player in the world at that time and then uh, you know deep rl took off okay it became very popular then eventually uh, google up acquired deep mind and so on this is like all history uh, so the paper is uh, right paper is human level control with deep learning right so uh, so uh, what we'll do is uh, today just uh, have you know a more fundamental look into what uh, dqn algorithm does so uh, what happens in Q-learning is, uh, so you have a state, right? You feed in a state, you feed in, okay, I should write it legibly. You have a state, you feed in a state, you feed in an action. These are your inputs, okay? This gets feeded. To basically some gets feeded to a Q table. Okay, so you have some tabular method wherein you store the value function for each corresponding state action pair. Okay, and you make a note of all these things. Okay, this is how you do in the classical Q learning, and eventually, what uh, you do is uh, Whenever the agent gets the, uh, it looks, it looks into this table and figures out the Q value that it needs. Okay, so basically it looks at the state action pair and then figures out its corresponding Q value with uh, the help of this uh, Q table. Okay, the way uh, people work with DQN is different. So here the input is the state action pair and the output is the Q value, right? So uh, instead in DQN, what happens is the input is uh, input is uh, only the state, not even the action. So what you do is you input the state, okay? And what do you input it to? You input it basically to some a fully connected neural network, right? Okay. I think. Okay, you basically input this to a fully connected neural network. And what it outputs is basically uh, the Q values, like for action one, and then Q values, or rather I should write. state okay so it outputs the corresponding q value for each individual action so you see the in, uh, okay so the input here is equivalent to the state space and the output here is equivalent to the uh, action space right so this is how uh, q learning uh, looks like okay so you can uh, see right what's happening here so can you tell me what uh, like one of the big uh, like limitation that uh, one can have with q learning based on this formulation so i have a neural network i feed in a state whatever is my state representation i don't even need to encode it into the files i if i have a state a vector which is of length let's say 100 i make an input layer with a size of 100 100 neurons and i pass it on through, through some hidden layers and then i uh, get the output equivalent to the action space. So what do you think could go wrong here? Or what do you think could be the possible limitation? OK, so the thing is, uh, this will only work if and only if your uh, this thing is discrete, right? If you have discrete actions, then only you can get the corresponding uh, Q values for action one, action two, and so on. Till action two. Isn't it true for all Q learning um, things? 
True, true. This is true for deep uh, deep queue learning as well. So deep queue learning is only applicable for uh, this is only applicable for discrete action spaces. You can't uh, apply DQN for continuous action spaces. And also this is true for uh, typical queue learning as well because uh, in normal queue learning we never explored the idea of a continuous action space. Right? So uh, that was uh, always a limitation. But in DQN also this limitation is still there. Okay, so DQN historically only deals with uh, discrete action spaces. Uh, now my question to you is, let's say, uh, forget about deep QN, people have developed more sophisticated algorithms over the year. So let's say if I have a continuous action space and I have a neural network, so what, how, how do you think the output should change? What should be the output for a continuous action space? Mm, what do you think? Your it, should be a regressor. it should be a regressor and a continuous value. Yeah, but if you have a regressor, how do you do your exploration? Right, regressor will directly give you a value. Yeah. So. So we use epsilon epsilon greedy action selection, right? Yeah. How do you do that? How do you do that? How do you do that epsilon greedy thing? In a normal uh, bandit problem, you know, you have you generate a random number. If it's less than that, you explore. Otherwise, you exploit. Yeah. So if, if if only the state space is continuous and not the action space, uh, then epsilon 3D should be fine. But uh, even then, taking max out actions on a regressor seems to be somewhat counterintuitive. Yeah, max only you do. The max is only for a Q uh, for a DQN. Let's say we forget about DQN. Okay. Let's say we are doing some other uh, actor critic method where where we don't need to take the max over the action, right? So here I, I'll uh, generate all the Q values and I'll take the, uh, select the uh, action having the maximum Q value. So my question is how do you, uh, like in general, what do you think your intuition would be if I want to, you know, like input state and give out the output for a continuous action? For a discrete action, yes, I know. I will, uh, you know, fix the output layer uh, equal to the size of the uh, action, the number of possible action or the action space, right? Okay, I'll tell you. So what happens in the continuous? Uh, uh, oh, you want to take a guess? No, no, no. Okay, yeah. So uh, in the continuous space, what you do is, uh, so let's say you have some neural network, okay? So here, in a continuous action space, you output two things. Okay, one is a mu and one is a sigma. Okay, so these two things you output, and once you have the mu and sigma, you correspondingly uh, make a normal distribution out of it, and then you sample from that normal distribution. That is obviously assuming that uh, the action that you have follows some sort of a Gaussian distribution. If you have, if it, uh, if the action follows some other distribution, you will. Uh, output whatever is a parameter uh, that characterizes that distribution, right? So if it's an exponential distribution, you will only output uh, the, uh, the DK parameter and then uh, draw that uh, uh, distribution and sample uh, sample an action from it. So this takes care of uh, the exploration part, right? Because uh, you have introduced some uh, variability in the action selection method, right? So this is how uh, people usually uh, work with continuous action spaces. But uh, DQN is a different problem altogether because eventually we have to take a max overall action. So this thing uh, won't hold true for DQN. So DQN is limited only to a discrete action space, right? So uh, I tell you, DQN uh, steps are like simple. Uh, all past experiences is stored by agent in a replay buffer. Okay, you can call it as you know uh, an experience memory or an experience replay. But uh, we'll discuss what a replay buffer is in uh, like in more depth later. Just telling you the normal step. So basically, what the agent does is uh, you uh, basically it uh, you leave it free in the environment. It uh, takes some action, 
you know and then uh, stores the uh, transition so the transition uh, transition it stores is the s a r and the uh, next state it goes to so all these transitions are stored uh, second thing is uh, that the next action is basically is predicted by output of q network right whatever initialize you have uh, you have a q network you, whatever you have initialize it with something then uh, you let the agent take certain actions you store it in a replay buffer and the next action you predict it using the output of the q network and then uh, your loss function is basically the mse of predicted q value and target q value right so ms is uh, your mean squared error okay ms stands for mean squared error so you just take uh, the loss function is basically the mean squared error of the predicted q value that you have and the target q value again we'll uh, look close uh, closer into what uh, predicted q network is and what a target q network is so the update for dqn looks something like this plus your alpha times rt plus 1 plus gamma of x of a right and uh, minus q of st comma at okay here this this part is your target and this part is basically your predicted Okay, this is how the q update looks like and the loss function that you are trying to minimize is basically uh, the uh, difference and the uh, the square of the difference between them okay we'll again look at the loss function how it looks like uh, but okay uh, you see the issue here is that uh, the target and the predicted both of them are basically predicted by the same network so in the target i am predicting this thing by means of a neural network and in the predicting the predicted part i am also predicting this based on uh, uh, the same neural network right based on whatever update it has made so basically what i am trying to do is i am trying to uh, chase a target which is non stationary this is also uh, this target part is non stationary because this is changing with each update that i make to the q function and also the predicted part is something which is uh, again being estimated from uh, the same neural network so i am basically chasing a non stationary target so the updates that i'll make are basically correlated within a trajectory so in in the same trajectory the updates that i'll make will be correlated with each other okay so this is one problem so uh, how do you solve that so because uh, since you have a non stationary target uh, how exactly do you think uh, a neural network uh, would be able to solve this because the variance would be very high right for each uh, sample that i uh, for each uh, uh, update that i make over a sample the variance would be very high because uh, it's a non stationary target right uh, let's so make way... another network called uh, the target network and update the target network uh, only at say n set each and yeah, step right, will update right. the target that's it that's it so yeah that that's exactly what we do right so basically uh, since this so uh, the target uh, as compared to the predicted part right so basically uh, uh, whatever your uh, uh, like whatever prediction you making you uh, make a copy of it so the neural network you make a copy of the neural network you say one of the neural network will predict the target and the other will uh, predict uh, predict the current estimate or estimate sorry i should use the word estimate so one of them estimates the target other est the, will estimate the predicted so uh, the thing is you freeze one of the neural network weights over a certain time period uh, so uh, what happens is uh, 
you have a neural network. This thing I'll call it as Q prime, which is my target net. Okay. And this is my uh, predicted net. So this thing is just a copy. Okay. All changes I'm making is on this part. This is only a copy. I'm just copying whatever way it's, this is, making a clone of it. And uh, the update is being done over here. So the thing is, the input is basically passed on to these things, these two things. So this is my input, whatever state this. This is passed to these these things. But uh, this uh, this weights are frozen. OK, this weights are frozen. So the weights update uh, happen here. Uh, you don't. Uh, you know, update the weights here. Only the weights are updated in the predicted net path. And after, you know, certain number of iterations. So let's say after uh, C number of iterations, I copy uh, weights from predicted net to target net. OK, so using this, basically, we uh, uh, using this, we you know uh, make this non-stationary target a somewhat stationary. You know, for uh, C iterations, this target is stationary. After that, the target changes, but you know, again for the next C iterations, this becomes stationary. Okay, so this is uh, uh, so this is one important part in DQN. So you have a target network. Okay, but the updates are only made on the predicted network. This is you know just a copy that you are maintaining, and you. In between, you know, transfer all the updates that you have over there, right? Uh, oh, sorry. Okay, I'm out of pages, it seems. Okay. Uh, second thing. Uh, second thing uh, in DQN is your experience replay, right? So you know these are the two distinguishing parts of DQN. One is the target network introduction of the target network, and second is the experience replay. So basically, what you do is uh, for each uh, tra uh, transition that the agent makes, it uh, basically stores it in the form of experience. Right. So all this data is stored in some sort of an experience, which we'll term it as ET. And then uh, you define a replay buffer, uh, capital D, which maintains a copy of many such experiences. OK. So this buffer has some finite uh, you know, length. Let's say the length of the buffer is uh, the length of the buffer is basically L. OK. So uh, you can at max store uh, L different experiences. But uh, the way here it works is you are storing all the experiences. And then eventually what you do is you sample uh, uniformly from these experiences to make, up, uh, to make you know, uh, updates to the uh, gradients that you have in the neural network. OK. So my loss function here is defined as this is basically the expectation of the Target part. Okay, this is parameterized by some theta, right? So I'll uh, just put a minus sign to denote that this is, you know, a frozen uh, a theta. I'm not actively updating this theta. Minus the Uh, Q value, which is uh, which is from the predicted network. I just make a whole square of it, and this is the loss function. And this expectation is basically your S A R S prime, which is sampled from uh, uniformly from the experience replay. Okay, so this is uh, how my experience replay looks like. So essentially, what you're doing is you're uh, in a way converting uh, your uh, Q learning problem into uh, a regression problem 
So what you do is you let the agent free. Uh, the agent goes in the environment, makes uh, collects certain number of experiences such that it has uh, enough uh, number of experiences. And uh, once you have that, once a certain threshold is uh, met, then after that you do your stochastic gradient, uh, 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 your stochastic gradient descent. So uh, in uh, uh, your uh, regression problem, you have a bunch of data set. So here also you are doing the same thing. You are uh, storing all the experiences and you're making some sort of a data set over here. And over, uh, over that you're performing your stochastic gradient descent, right? So this is uh, Q-learning, uh, like DQN in a crux, right? So uh, if I were to draw it out, uh, let's say this is you know some agent that you have. You take certain actions in your you know let's say this is some okay, some environment okay. Take some actions in the environment. The environment returns you the observations right and uh, what you do is for each observation that you get you uh, term it as an experience and you basically store it in you know some uh, something known as a replay buffer so each uh, so this can be thought of as a stack. So whenever you uh, like draw out an experience, you will store it in this uh, stack. And then eventually, when this is you know full up to a certain limit, you basically try to uh, sample your experiences. So so by sampling, you you know make some you know some kind of updates over this. Okay, and then uh, the, from this sampling, you use it to update your gradients, right? So your gradients are your neural networks, right? And eventually this uh, parameters, uh, the learned parameters are passed onto the uh, network and also there should be a back propagation of the parameters that happen here, right? So this is a DQN concept right should call it dqn concept so this is what uh, dqn looks like uh, i think yeah that's all uh, there is uh, if you want i can write out the uh, algorithm for dqn uh, maybe i should okay so you so you start with So you start with your Q S comma A, okay? So Q is zero. You get your initial state S. Now for you know K one to two, you basically uh, sample your action A and get next state S prime. You say if uh, S prime is terminal, then you store it. Uh, then your Q value is just the immediate reward. Else, uh, this is your immediate reward plus your max of the next q value right so these are all standard q uh, q learning updates that you are doing so uh, once you do that for k number of iterations okay after that you want to update your theta so your theta update is basically uh, gradient descent where the gradient is over your SARS 
and what you are uh, taking over is basically the q value uh, that the network predicts minus the bootstrap uh, target updates that you have uh, done so far right yeah right so this is dqn i think uh, uh, this is fine okay uh, that's all i had to cover in uh, text maybe i can you know uh, show some implementation using uh, for dqn uh, using some open air gym environment i think with that we can wrap up the class uh, okay before that ashwin maybe i can answer your question okay just okay so uh, your question was uh, in assignment uh, sorry in week 8 question 6 uh, the question uh, was about lsdi that uh, uh, what is it okay to solve the given optimization problem uh, to solve the given optimization problem uh, this thing I mean, okay, I shouldn't write this. Okay. So, uh, so the question is, uh, for discrete action, we can't maximize it explicitly. We need to formulate a classification problem. So, uh, you know, what happens uh, in LSTI is that uh, since you can't uh, do an arg max right over a large number of action spaces, so what you do is you only uh, solve the optimization problem for you know some select few uh, states so for some j states you do you solve the optimization and figure out the corresponding actions a of j okay and then uh, this is used to estimate the state space this is used to estimate the pi of s and eventually what you're trying to do is you create some data set right so this is your phi one of s1 phi two s1 dot dot phi k S1, right? And similarly, you have your okay. This is phi j of S1. Sorry, uh, be phi one of S j, phi two of S j, and phi k of s j right so this thing these are the number of actions that you estimate right so the thing is if uh, these action cases that you have made if this is finite then you use a classifier okay if this is finite you use a classifier or otherwise if the problem statement tells you that uh, you need some sort of a regressor based on the uh, action uh, g actions that you have uh, sampled uh, even otherwise you use a regressor okay so this is if this this uh this action cases that you have okay if this is finite you use a classifier otherwise you use a regressor so i hope yeah it's uh, just, uh, finite action okay. versus continuous action right okay okay cool uh maybe i can sh uh, should stop this Okay, can you guys see my screen? Yes. Okay, okay. cool. Uh, okay. Wait, uh, you still haven't answered the question, right? Uh, which one? The, the action space was finite and it is discrete. So we need a classification. No, not the action space. It's the action case that you have. Sorry, I didn't understand. So uh, once you have uh, what you do is since you can't uh, solve it, uh, solve the optimization problem for all possible actions, 
over yeah. which you take the max you uh, randomly uh, solve it for uh, some j states mm -hmm. yeah right so, and, and correspondingly you so i uh, you, use the second equation which is r max over a uh, product of phi and theta yeah so basically you solve it for uh, j j such uh, uh, states you solve the optimization you get uh, uh, j actions you get actions a1 a2 dot 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 aj right yeah so if those uh, j actions uh, you know are you know finite on the uh, sampled uh, uh, states over which i solve the optimization problem if that particular action is finite then you use a classifier not if the uh, action space in discrete uh, in in the beginning itself okay okay uh. like see here they are written for discrete action space as we can't maximize it explicitly now this is incorrect right? because you can maximize it explicitly for discrete action space so the reason is incorrect and again uh, you don't do it for discrete action space but uh, if the uh, j actions that you have sampled if that is finite it could be infinite also right yeah but uh, it could be continuous uh, right can i share my screen first you don't mind yeah yeah sure, sure. <laughs> so this is from uh, the previous assignment right uh, so the same so question the previous yeah okay. uh, from the nptel website so okay. uh, are you sharing your screen solve, okay yes, i've stopped I sharing and, oh, i can't uh, see i i stopped okay. i stopped sharing i can't Hold see huh? yeah is it visible now uh, yes yes yeah. So this is a question from NPTEL website, the same question. Mm -hmm. uh, oh, in the previous run. Okay. Yeah. So to solve the given optimization problem for some states with a linear function approximator, okay. uh, we use a Q function. We formulate a classification problem for discrete action space. Yeah. And the reason is that uh, the given problem is equivalent to solving uh, product mm -hmm. of mm -hmm. and, uh, theta. Okay, and the answer to that was given us both the assertion reason are true, and reason is the correct explanation for assertion. Oh, solve the given optimization problem with linear function approximator. We formulate a classification problem for discrete action space. Yeah. Okay. 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 They have used action space here. Okay. This is confusing. So you see the classification problem uh, you are formulating uh, over the uh, actions that you have sampled, uh, over the states you have sampled, and the actions that you have solved for. Okay, that's clear, right? Eh? Yeah, yeah, yes. It's not over the entire action space. Yeah. So uh, okay. Okay. So even then, uh, mm -hmm. the assertion should be true, right? Or is it not? Maybe I'm misunderstanding. Here the, here the assertion is true, no? <laughs> oh, okay. Maybe I should look at the question. Just to some slight wordplay, I feel. We formulate a classification problem for discrete action space. And here it's written, in case of discrete action space, formulate a classification problem. So the uh, wording yeah. changes the whole meaning, right? Here, in uh, week eight, question six, the wording is different, so it changes the meaning completely. Okay. 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 You see that? Right? Yeah. Okay. Makes sense. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Stop my screen. Sure. Sure. Okay. So, I'll quickly. We'll quickly see at uh, the implementation. This is a collab file for implementing the cart pole problem. Okay, so a quick introduction to the cart pole problem. So uh, what it uh, what the problem does is very simple. So basically, you have a cart on which uh, there is a, a pole that you're balancing. Okay, so there is a cart over which you're balancing a pole, and uh, you're moving the cart left and right, and the pole should be upright. It should it shouldn't fall right. It's like a game you used to play. 
with your umbrella in your childhood you used you were trying to balance the umbrella on your fingertip so that it stays straight and it uh, you know doesn't fall beyond a certain angle uh, omega okay so this is the problem so there is a cart which is moving the cart should move left right so that the pole which is upright it is balanced and it shouldn't uh, you know fall beyond a certain degree uh, otherwise i say the episode has failed okay so what you're controlling is basically uh, uh, the motion of the cart right so the cart can either move to the left or it can move to the right and uh, based on the movement of the cart the pole you know changes its uh, direction based on the physics uh, that you have in the cart pole dynamic and uh, also another constraint is that the cart should uh, remain within the frame okay so if uh, the frame is let's say uh, a screen of uh, size let's say 60 cross 80 pixel so the uh, the cart can only move in one direction it can only move uh, in left or right and it should you know stay within frame and the pole should be balanced so this is the uh, classic cart pole problem so uh, just to have a quick look at the action space so the action space is uh, it's zero one so uh, action zero means that you push the cart to the left and then action one is you push the cart to the right and the observation that you get is basically a four tuple okay so one is the cart position this is uh, minimum minus 4.8 and maximum 4.8 so the cart is moving uh, you know from x equal to minus 5 to x equal to plus 5 or x equal to minus 4.8 to x equal to plus 4.8 it's moving between these two points and the uh, cart velocity uh, this can be you know minus infinity to infinity uh, third thing is the pole angle so the pole angle uh, should be between minus 24 degree and plus 24 degree so if it falls beyond 24 degree uh, uh, it will eventually fall down okay so you can't you know make it upright again after it goes beyond 24 degree and uh, fourth thing is the pole's angular velocity okay and the reward is uh, since the goal is to keep the pole upright for as long as possible a reward of plus one for every step taken including the terminal state is allotted the threshold of the reward is 457 for version one of the problem so for each time step that the pole is uh, upright you get a reward of plus one if it falls down the episode ends and you start over again okay the episode ends if the pole angle is greater than plus minus 12 degrees so it's not 24 it's 12 degrees their threshold is 12 degree second is the cart pole uh, the cart position is greater than uh, plus minus 2.4 center of the cart reaches the edge of the display okay so this is uh, plus minus 2.4 and uh, the episode length is greater than 200 okay so sorry 500 so if i go beyond 500 episodes yeah uh, i say okay uh, the episode is a success and i terminate i start with a new uh, new episode right so this is the card pole problem this is a open air gym environment so you have the initialization over here you uh, all the dynamics the system dynamics is there in this this is the step function so you feed in the action and it will return you the next state reward and whether you have reached the terminal state or not and uh, this is the reset function. So if you call the reset function, you again reinitialize your environment to the uh, original configuration. And lastly, uh, also you have a render function. So render function is for visualization purposes, right? So these uh, four things are necessary for a gym environment. Also you need to define your action and the state spaces eventually. So once you have that, so uh, this is a collab implementation for a DQN algorithm. I'll share this in the chat okay, okay. so uh, i won't run it it will take a lot of time to execute it so this since this is a notebook and it is already executed so if you execute this first block, it will uh, download all the necessary packages that you require in order to run this code. OK, so once you have done that here, you are calling all the necessary library functions. This is a class wherein you uh, define the replay buffer, right? So you initialize it. The store uh, method basically uh, uh, stores the observation, action, reward, and the next observation and the done part in the replay buffer. And when you call this uh, method sample batch, so this is when you're updating your theta parameters. So the sample batch will, uh, you know, randomly sample uh, how, I mean, how many number of uh, like uh, sample experiences you need for the updates, right? 
and uh, this is uh, your uh, DQN network. So here they have, uh, uh, we are using a PyTorch. So PyTorch is basically a deep, uh, deep RL. It's a library for deep learning. So they typically work with a diff, uh, new data set. Uh, it's known as a tensor. So PyTorch is uh, useful because uh, uh, the codes that they have for uh, tensors, it's uh, very much similar uh, in working with uh, in working with a numpy array so it's easier to work with pytorch but still pe people prefer tensorflow so these are two different uh, deep learning libraries so here i'm defining your uh, the dqn model this is the neural network so the neural network is basically uh, this is the input dimension which is the state space which is uh, size 4 then one hidden layer of size 128 so from input layer i go to hidden layer 128 then from 128, I go to another hidden layer of 128. And then from 128, I go to the output dimension, which is uh, your left right action, right? So it's input layer, 128, 128, and the output layer. Okay. And this forward function basically, you know, does a, uh, like, uh, gives the output. So in the forward function, I pass in the input. And when I do forward this, so I get the corresponding output. Okay. So this is uh, a class for the DQN agent. This is the summary of the DQN class. So you have these different different methods. Select action basically selects an action from the input state. Step takes an action and returns the response of the environment. This computes the DQN loss. This updates the model. This is for the target hard update. Hard update means after CI iterations, you do a hard update, right? So this is like when you copy all the data from the predicted network to the target network. This is for train, this is for test, and this is for plotting purposes. So this is the entire DQN class, OK? Uh, then uh, uh, for the environment, I'm directly calling the uh, uh, OpenAI gym environment. So this is known as Cartpool uh, version one. So I just type gym dot make uh, uh, in inside the uh, inverted quotes. I write Cartpool version one, and then I set the random seed, and then I initialize all the hyperparameters. So I need this many number of frames, this uh, this much of memory size. This is the batch size target update after every 100 steps, epsilon decays 1 by 200. And then I initialize uh, the agent, OK, from the DQN agent class. And you know this is uh, how the training looks like for you know 1,000 frames. So frame is basically uh, each second in the, uh, how do I say? Frame is basically each second that I uh, take in the uh, cardful environment. So each step is one frame. OK, so this is how the uh, learning looks like. So the score, this is score. Uh, that is uh, uh, the evolution of the score with uh, each uh, time step or each frame. This is the loss function, the corresponding loss function. And this is how the epsilons decay. OK, so this has been trained. Uh, I'm not training it right now. It will take some time. OK. And then lastly, uh, this is the test part. So uh, after this, this much training has been done, so this is a test part. So you can see this is what the agent has learned till now. Okay, so uh, this is staying upright, but uh, the cart, you know, is moving outside the frame. So this is with uh, how many training? This is for uh, you know 1,000 frames, 1,000 number of frames. Okay, so this is the training for 1,000 number of frames or 1,000 time steps, if you uh, think of it that way. So this is how uh, the training looks like. So you take this code. You know, you can play around, maybe train it for, you know, more number of episodes, more number of time steps. And eventually, you can see some performances. OK, so this is a, a collab DQN implementation uh, using PyTorch. OK. So yeah, that's all I had for uh, today. I think I'm already over time. So this class was about DQN. Uh, if you have any questions, please. Uh, do ask, otherwise, I'm done from my end. Any questions? None from my side. Thank you. Okay, sure. Thank you, then. Have a nice weekend. Bye. See you.